please remember to subscribe on my channel and also to share with your friends because when you subscribe you support this ministry welcome back from easter break here on bible academics my name is reverend richard musinguzi are you someone who's asking yourselves these questions uh, was jesus really dead after his painful experience on the cross or perhaps was his tomb empty on the first easter morning or did credible people encounter him if you're someone who asks yourself those questions then perhaps you need to read the case for easter by lee strobel so uh, basically uh, lee strobel's book is actually inspired by the different interviews he does with three scholars one of the scholars we are going to see we are going to see uh, um, we are going to see alexander metherell we are also going to see uh, william lane craig uh, the popular writer of uh, reasonable faith some of you have read it then also there's another writer called uh, gary habamas so those are the three scholars that uh, guide the writings uh, in this book the case for easter now to begin with we are going to look at the medical evidence of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and uh, the person who is interviewed here is uh, Alexander Metherell. Now this is what Alexander Metherell has to say. Yes, as um, uh, Lee Strobel is uh, uh, heading towards uh, interviewing uh, uh, Alexander Metherell, there was a, a theory that kept, uh, you know, disturbing him the theory of the the swoon theory now the swoon theory basically says that you know jesus did not die on the cross he actually uh, did not die he just became unconscious and later on his body was revived so he that's that theory has been popular over years but the interview of uh, 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 metherell is actually going to disprove that theory it's not very don't have enough evidence really we cannot say that jesus was on the cross with a lot of pain and later on you know he was unconscious and then was revived again so that theory does not have a lot of evidence around it now this is what metherell has to say concerning the torture uh, before the cross there was some torture before the cross now uh, something happens to Jesus you know Jesus is already aware that he's going to be crucified now he, he it say that you know he was he was nervous he was already stressed because you know the death on the cross was not going to be very easy so his body was very nervous and um, uh, Metherell actually says that it's that his body actually produced chemicals uh, it produced chemicals and these chemicals um, uh, caused uh, you know the breakdown of capillaries and these capillaries led to bleeding in the sweat glands and uh, actually when you read the story of the, the the prayer in Gethsemane you remember Jesus was praying those final prayers saying Lord if it's possible take away this cup of suffering from me and you remember when he was praying it's actually said that you know he was sweating like you know th there was sweat which was you know pouring like blood you know the, the sweat was more like drips of blood so there there were small drips of blood uh that could have actually you know powered and and that's what they call hemat hematrodis you know hem hematrodis uh you will see it on the screen so it's it's a it's a medical term you know talking about the bleeding of the sweat glands so it it, it actually proves that you know that prayer he made in that garden uh, has some medical evidence because he, he actually as he was praying the sweat came down like you know drips of blood so methyl says that you know that 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 evidence you know has it makes sense because there is a medical truth about that now the other thing he also says is um that jesus experienced what we call hypovolemic shock he calls it a hypovolemic shock now this shock is all about losing a lot of blood you know like we earlier said you know the the the, the skin was already sensitive uh the, there was a lot of bleeding in the sweat glands and so when it came to the point of being uh, tortured with the the you remember the, the 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 39 lashes you know the skin was already sensitive and there was a lot of bleeding that was involved even as they were you know flogging jesus and actually this is what he says could have happened he says one of the things that could have happened was that there could have been a lot of bleeding already uh, because of the flogging and uh, of course also because of the over bleeding then the heartbeat now was was now irregular because the heart was trying to pump blood which has, was actually not there and then the other thing he also says that um, 
that also the, the blood pressure went low, you know. And because of the blood pressure being low, there was a lot of fainting, you know, collapsing. And it's, it could also approve what actually happened to Jesus. Remember, he was carrying the cross. And later on, you know, he becomes and, you know, he faints. And then they had to call some, some other person um, uh, to help him, Simon, to help him carry the cross. So it, 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 there could be that medical evidence there that you are, he had really lost a lot of blood. So, he you know, he could not connect well and he was collapsing here and there, falling down and up. And then the other thing also um, that is actually said is, you know, the, the kidneys stopped uh, producing urine, uh, you know, because, you know, they were trying to maintain what's already there. So the kidneys, there was a kidney failure. So there's a possibility that there was also a kidney failure. Yeah, and so the other thing that is actually said is that uh, uh, Jesus became very, very thirsty. And you know, he became so thirsty. So the body was demanding more water so that perhaps it can also produce more blood. So we, we see that in the Bible, you know, Jesus was thirsty and he's asking for water. So that uh, this medical evidence that Metharel is trying to show us could actually prove that these experiences we are seeing in the Gospels have a medical evidence that really they happened. So that's what he submits. And then the other thing he also submits is uh, about the, the torture on the cross. Now, the torture was really intense. Uh, actually, it is said that they used uh, seven inch nails, seven inch nails. And um, some people say they were uh, through the palms here, but actually he says that that wasn't possible because if it was through the palms, then the, the body would have fallen off the cross because the tissues would have uh, would have there would have been a tearing in the tissue and the body would have fallen off the cross so that weight was so heavy so the best thing they did the actually the evidence is very likely he was crucified on through the wrist the wrist here because the wrist is a very hard it's a very hard bone so his body was intact on the cross so there was no room for his body to fall down so it was intact there and then the other thing is about he says about that torture on the cross is the nail is said to have hit through the median nerve, the median nerve. Now it says that the median nerve, if anything hits that median nerve, he says the pain is equal to the pain of accidentally hitting your elbow. I don't know if you've ever hit your elbow. The pain of accidentally hitting your elbow, that's the pain that Jesus experienced when they were hitting through the median nerve. And so he says that the pain was so intense so that torture uh, really is not a superficial. There is a medical evidence to that, that for sure, if he was nailed through the wrist, really the pain was so, so, uh, the pain was so, so intense. Now, the other thing that, um, that uh, we need to, uh, uh, which, which Metharil talks about is the cause of his death. So what was the cause of his death? Uh, Metharil has this to say. He actually says that, you know, uh, the cause of his death was actually asphyxiation. Now, asphyxiation is a condition which happens like this, you know. He actually thinks, you know, that Jesus was actually, you know, having a lot of stress on his muscles uh, and, on, and also on his diaphragm. So there was, uh, you know, his body was forcefully trying to inhale, inhaling oxygen and in the process, uh, the body had to forcefully push the feet downwards so that you know they can be he was able to breathe in and breathe out and so in that process he was also hurting his foot because the nails were inside the foot so that 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 pressure on the body was not easy because he was trying to breathe in and out and in the process he became very exhausted now because of becoming very exhausted this is what could have happened he says there was a carbon dioxide that was dissolved within the blood which caused you know led to some uh, uh, respiratory uh, acidic acidicity you know there were some acids that were produced within the blood and it um, it poisoned the blood and in the process the heartbeat now started becoming very irregular and in the process uh, he uh, suffered from cardiac arrest that's where we see Jesus breathing his last you know when he breathes his last and you know, that's what happened. They call it the cardiac arrest and Jesus died. So actually, it, it has some medical evidence on what was actually happening on the cross. It's not superficial. They are not movies. These are things that really, really happened. And then finally, uh, there's that question. 
about uh, Jesus is, uh, uh, you know, that Jesus did not die, that did Jesus really die? Of course he really died. You know, he, you cannot say Jesus did not die because he lost a lot of blood and even if there was room for him to escape, let me just give him that, uh, let's put in that room for, you know, escape. It was impossible, he would have collapsed on the way and even then he says even if Jesus had survived, really, no one would have uh, wanted to start a movement of following Jesus Christ. He was already shapeless, he was beaten, he was not looking attractive. So th there was nothing attractive on Jesus at that point, you know, of him uh, dying on the cross. So really Jesus died. So there is no one who should, uh, uh, he's saying no one should actually try to create room for doubt. R Jesus really died, he suffered on the cross and he died. So in conclusion, uh, uh, Lee Strobel asks uh, Methuel a question, you know, he's a medical person and he says, what do you think compelled, you know, Jesus to really suffer for, you know, for human, for, hum for the human race? Why? Why would he have to suffer? And he gave one submission, which I thought uh, would interest all of us. He said, love. Friends, Jesus could not have sacrificed for me and you if it was not for love. So that's a submission that uh, Methuel uh, gives to Listro, which I think is very, very important as we continue to reflect on this book. The other interview was to William Lane Craig and uh, his focus is on evidence of the missing body. You know, some people still say, you know, where they stole the body, you know, there are so many <laughs> theories that have come up that the body of Jesus was stolen. His body was not missing. He only resurrected, period. Now, this is what Len Craig has to say. You know, he actually talks about uh, the evidence of the book. So one of the questions that uh, Lee Strobel asks uh, Len Craig was, was Jesus really buried in the tomb? <laughs> now, you'll be very surprised by the submission of Len Craig. You would think of some other thing outside the box. But this is what he submits. He submits 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's one of those old writings of Paul and it's actually dated uh, between 55 AD, uh, from 55 AD. It's a really an old writing of Paul and it's very unique and it actually talks about a creed. You know, he gives evidence of how Jesus died. He says he received this from this information from the reliable source. I imagine he could have received it from the disciples that he died, that he also rose again. And, and when you read also, continue reading in that chapter, he, Paul actually says that he even appeared to 500 and he even goes ahead to say that some of them are actually still alive. So it means uh, Paul had an opportunity to interact with some of these people because Paul said some of them are still even alive now. So Jesus appeared to 500 more people. So uh, that's one of the evidence we still have. And it's one of those old creeds even before the Apostles' Creed was, you know, revised and all that, that is one of the oldest creeds and, and, and it's something that I would think uh, Christians, we need to, you know, to revive, you know, the creeds, you know. When you read the creeds, it's something that helps us to keep remembering and it's not some old tale. We can see it from the old writings of, um, of Paul uh, in First Corinthians chapter 15. So that's one of those evidence that Helen Craig gives concerning the evidence of the tomb being empty. You'll find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The other question that Lee Strobel asks is, was Joseph of Arimathea historical? You know, there is that, uh, uh, there's that uh, account of Joseph of Arimathea. You know, Joseph was actually a member of the Sanhedrin. Now, some people disprove that. They say that actually Joseph did not bury Jesus. That actually he was among those who cast the, the, the ballot uh, in favor of the crucifixion of Jesus. But actually, when you read the Gospels very well, he actually says that actually it's, that Joseph wa was not actually in that meeting when they were casting ballots in favor of the crucifixion of Jesus. So, and actually also the other thing he, he says that in the history of the Jewish culture, there is no one who disproves uh, that Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph. It's not a tradition, no, the, they don't find it in the Jewish traditions that they are opposing, you know, this evidence. No one is opposing it. And so he says that not, should not be a, a really a big issue. Joseph is historical. He actually requested for the body of Jesus and he actually went and ensured that his, the body was buried in his tomb. 
So that one should not be a, a problem, he says. The other question he asks, how secure was the tomb? How secure was the tomb? That's the other question that uh, Lee Strobel is asking uh, William. Now this is what he says. He says actually, the tomb was secure. Uh, whether the, the guards were there or not, it's not a big deal because that, that stone was very heavy. Actually, it is said rolling the stone was very easy. But to unroll that stone, it would require several men, maybe seven to eight or even ten men to unroll that stone. So, yeah, we can say it was not secure because there were no guards. But even if the guards were not there, it was still secure because to unroll that stone, it was not going to be very, very easy. So that should not be a big issue. The, the tomb was actually very secure, whether with the, with the, the security guards or whether without security guards. So the, the tomb was secure enough. Then the other question that, that, that is asked is where the guards actually present. He, for sure, when you read the Gospels, there are very many accounts about the guards. You know, when you look at that point when Jesus was going to be arrested, we see uh, the, the guards commanded by the, 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 the Jewish leaders, you know, to arrest Jesus. And, and it's very, it is actually said very likely these soldiers were Roman soldiers. And, and so there is no doubt about that, really. The guards were present uh, because actually they were told to guard uh, the tomb at that point. Okay, then the other question that he was asking, what about the contradictions? You know, some gospel writers were writing uh, accounts which are a bit, you know, different from the other. You know, some of them are similar, but, you know, they are written in a certain way. And this is what he actually says. He says, you know, different writers were writing in a certain style, you know, Mark's style of writing is totally different from Matthew's style of writing. So that one should not worry us. The, the point is, at least they had information that was almost similar. Yeah, there could be, maybe they say the women went in first, or maybe Peter went in first, or maybe John, that kind of thing. It doesn't matter. Yes, there could have been a style. And also maybe he says, you know, the audience, you know, the audience they were writing to also, uh, could have influenced the way the different accounts are coming in play. So that one shouldn't worry us. Of course, a philosopher will make that a big issue, but a historian doesn't make that a big issue because every account comes with a different style of writing. So that one should not really worry us about the contradictions here and there. Yes, and then the other thing is, uh, was can, can the writers also be trusted? Eh? Can we trust Matthew, Luke, John, that for sure what they were writing was correct? Now, this is what uh, uh, William says. William actually is saying that the evidence they wrote about was uh, through the women. It's the women who actually gave the first account of Jesus being resurrected from the tomb. It's the women who give this account. Now, he says, there is no Jewish man who can confidently write about a woman's account. Actually, in the Jewish culture, it was even a taboo to write about an account of a woman. Anything that a woman would report was not very, very uh, so important as per se. It was, yes, they could receive it, but it was not really something that you'd stand out and say it's very important. So uh, he says, you know, if they were able to give an account through the women, then that is evidence enough because it was already embarrassing but they were confident to write about the women's account because that was the evidence they had about the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The other question that, um, that uh, Lee Strobel wants to ask, of course, is why did the women then visit the tomb? Because already the tomb was closed. Why did they have to go and um, anoint the body of Jesus? Yeah, yeah I, I would also ask myself the same question but this is what uh, uh, william says william actually says we should not focus on why we focus on their devotion you know women are risk takers so they could have gone because they had love and devotion for jesus and maybe they had some some hope that maybe something a miracle can happen and you know somehow <laughs> we see a miracle happening they find the tomb empty and so but even then we also have to uh, to acknowledge that you know the anointing of the bodies the dead bodies was was a, a jewish practice it was not something new they used to anoint the bodies and uh, it was part of the, the the jewish practice so it's not a strange thing it should not be something that we you know try to think about and say you know why did the women have to go and yet the tomb was already closed could they have stolen the body let's not begin to assume like that they could have 
just felt the love and the devotion for Jesus. And you know, any, anybody who loses a loved one, even when they, you're going to put the, the coffin in the tomb, there is that thought of maybe the person will come back to life. So maybe it was out of love and devotion that the women went to check out on the tomb. Yes, the other question that Lee Strobo is asking, why didn't the Christians then cite the empty tomb? You know, there was the, the issue of the Christians and the Jews. But you know, even when you read in Acts 2.24, Peter doesn't talk about the empty tomb, but he talks about Jesus having died, having resurrected. And uh, yeah, so many accounts in Acts, you know, they talk about, you know, they don't talk about the empty tomb, but you keep on seeing, you know, Paul also addressing, saying, you know, Jesus died, Jesus resurrected. So we cannot say that, you know, because they never mentioned the empty tomb, then the Christians did not have a clear idea about the empty tomb. They did, maybe just they didn't use the word empty tomb, we can say Jesus resurrected. So we cannot rule that out. We cannot say uh, that, you know, the Christians did not know, did not, you know, acknowledge that, you know, there was an empty tomb. The empty tomb for sure was there because they acknowledged that Jesus uh, resurrected. Okay, so in a nutshell, this is what uh, William had to conclude with. He says, you know, this evidence of the missing body is seen in the writing of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's the oldest writing that we have left. It is the oldest writing which even has in the creed uh, that we can rely on. So he's saying, you know, that writing is very old and it's what we can rely on and it's really evidence that the body was not missing. Jesus actually was not missing, but he had actually resurrected. And then also, of course, he says, you know, uh, we have the evidence of the, the missing writings of Mark, you know, there were that missing writings, the early, the old manuscripts that were missing in the book of uh, the gospel according to Mark. And you know, those are also accounts that we can rely on because they are also very, very old. And those are the, 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 the writings we have, which we can also rely on about the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And of course also that, you know, the Christians and the Jews had a similar view about the empty tomb. So if the Christians and the Jews were not, uh, you know, uh, colliding with each other over that information, then that is evidence that for sure there was an empty tomb and really Jesus was not just meeting, missing. He had actually resurrected from the tomb. And then finally also, we also have to acknowledge that if it was against the Jewish culture to have the account of women written down, if the gospel writers were confident enough uh, to write what the women were, were write, uh, talking about, the empty, the empty tomb uh, and the accounts of the women, if they were able to write that, then that is evidence enough that for sure these writings uh, can be trusted because, you know, they are, they, are, they, are, they are going out of their traditions to write about what the women had actually given account of about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, and finally, he interviews also um, Gary Habermas. So Gary Habermas, of course, is an expert in the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, actually, when he's asked about the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he gives a same submission like William Craig. He actually says the creed, he brings back the creed written by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He actually says that's the evidence that actually there, and it's an old writing. Yes, we have to end here, really. I think you've seen really the evidence uh, of uh, the different scholars uh, that you know the writings of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 are really uh, the resource that we can rely on concerning the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I encourage you uh, to remain firm in Jesus Christ, continue to love him, continue to fix your eyes on him. I felt uh, I needed to pray with someone who is actually doubting uh, and you know you're not having that assurance of salvation and maybe you feel it's an opportunity for you to surrender to Jesus Christ. Can I lead you in a word of prayer? Okay, let's pray together. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for accepting to die on the cross for me. Today, I ask you to come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Rub my name from the book of death and write my name in the book of life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Father, I thank you for your daughter and your son who has accepted you as their Lord and Savior. I pray that you walk with them, you encourage them, 
that every force that was fighting them, discouraging them, that today they are crossing over from death to life because you have accepted them as your children. So may the Lord bless you as you continue to walk in this salvation journey with Jesus Christ. Otherwise, before I leave, please I encourage you to subscribe on this channel and continue to share with your friends the message of Jesus Christ. God bless you.